chapter 5 of the conquest of Doe. This is a reading from my Reads the edit file of the first draft for the um, blog of uh, Conquest of Doe. The other four preceding chapters are available on the website or my blog. The Sky is Falling In, Chapter 5. The sashaying roundness of the most divine backside ever draped in sheer Galliano little black dressness waved its departure as Roger glanced up with a white powder dusted on the 3am shadow on his top lip. He poured himself a slug of Glemorangi from the open bottle amongst the debris upon the marble-topped table in the lounge of his suite in the Four Seasons Canary Wharf, London. A regular haunt and a venue for all of his worst habits, an eerie from where, retreat from a world spiralling out of control, he could pretend he was free. Earlier that day he had received a phone call from his lobbyist in Whitehall. MI6 and the CIA had reports from the White Helmets that the Aleppo Doe had been identified and the present threat to the final capture of Syria and destruction of Assad would soon be secured. The consortium which Roger managed and was a majority shareholder in would then be able to progress with developing their interests in the Golden Heights and Roger, a property developer, would be able to implement the marina development at Tartus, the Russian naval yard. A strange calling echoed in the back of his conscience. Bunto Thompson, his old Burlington buddy, had been busy spinning artifices at the UN earlier. Having risen to foreign secretary, having narrowly missed out on the premiership, it had been Bunto who had cleared the way for Rog to get the marina contract in Tripoli. It had been a shame that the Crimea deal had fallen through. Their fathers had also greatly profited back in the day with the marina deal in Split. Bunto didn't ever seem to give a second thought to his own peccadilloes. Perhaps it was all that practice with the whip's office. But Rog, never a politician, was never happy with the MI6 control file and often woke in a cold sweat with that recurring nightmare of that strange little guy in the gabardine coat pushing the manila envelope across the table at the Travellers Club in St James. He had lost his first marriage anyway, even without his wife and international lawyer having seen the incriminating pictures. Buntos, he knew, were far worse, as were Cranbournes and Gideons, with their strange gull and bones fetishes. Rog had never accepted their invitations to Bohemian Grove, and his Bilderberg meeting invite had been withdrawn after one particularly unfortunate incident, when he projectile vomited into the newly coiffed hair of the mistress of some guy Bunto said was high up with that lot. Rog wasn't interested. He often told his old Burlington buddies, those guys are a bunch of wankerers, as Bunto had dubbed the president of Turkey. But that strange calling, what was that sounded like? Brothers, I will return to retrace our forebears' journey of truth and peace. Rog went across to the huge plate glass windows of his suite and pulled back the sliding door and strolled out onto the terrace. He leant on the barrier, looking up at the stars. He heard that calling again in the back of his mind. Brothers, I will return to retrace our forebears' journey of truth and peace. Rog asked himself out loud, am I making a mistake? Looking up at the stars, disappointed, wondering if it was indeed a mistake, he knew he had made many and this was perhaps going to be his biggest mistake one he may not be able to recover from. At once he imagined looking down across the hills at the city lights below, another time, another place. Somewhere in all of those city lights was the one. Where would he find the one? Where would happiness lie? From east to west, from the poor parts of town to the fun palaces of the West End, or the workplaces with the sensible secretaries all tied back hair and sensible heels, barely concealing a taste for adventure and something more. 
to the suburbs, the boring suburbs which existed only to feed the machine of consumerism, or maybe out there in the countryside, beyond the neon and strip lights glow, beyond the artificial illumination, in the darkness, the unknown, maybe there. Back to the present sky, Rog looked up, the cool breeze approaching the dawn, the darkest hour, clear, infinite distances above, light years away, astronomical arc distances, the hopelessness of it all dawned. How could it be? What are the chances of choosing the right world? Who could know which sun would warm the shores of the desert island he had become? The selection of where to aim the rocket ship, which galaxy, which region, which planet, which hemisphere? What are the chances of making the right choices? At what point do you call back to mission control? All systems read negative. Request change course. Ground controlled to Major Tom. Shut down systems. And there he was, looking at the blue world, suspended in the eternal contradiction. Cut your losses or carry on. Plenty more fish in the sea, Mam always used to say. Is it chicken licking at this point? Which story occurs? That old story we all knew as kids, the sky is falling in? Maybe the Emperor's new clothes, perhaps that one about Crying Wolf. For all the spaceships, quantum mechanics and logic, the semantics and semiotics, the algebra, calculus and theoretical physics, the maths and the scientific method, when all the rationalism is performed and when all is said and done, he thought, ma'am, she expressed it best, so much more clearly, Plenty more fish in the sea. The infinity sign, he thought, looks a bit like a fish. A push you pull me fish. Dr. Doolittle. Why was it that Dr. Doolittle reminded him of Pygmalion, my fair lady? Ah, Ralph Richardson, a signifier connecting totally unconnected stories from two different worlds. So why not cut the losses? Leave the table. Quit while you're ahead. Leave the table like you used to so often at the casino in Cannes. Walk away with your winnings, quilt, quit whilst you're ahead. Set your upper and lower bounds. Limit your potential losses. After all, no one ever went broke making a profit. They can't hurt you if you don't care. Well, that was just it. He loved his children and didn't want to screw up their world. This was not about him, he thought. Not about him, not about ego not about anything other than loving and caring, and they, his children, could be in the world with understanding and empathy, and not the cynicism that had come to grip his own life. That cynicism born of want, inherited from his dad. Expensive presents are always better, even if we forget your actual birthday. Always by all your round. What's the strongest bridge in the world? That one, oh please no, not that one. Another pub story, fueled by more alcohol and false bonhomie. No, none of that. His kids would be allowed to find out who they were and how much of life can really be lived without pretending. How could he escape and not leave a scar that would never heal? How could he get out without depriving his children of, albeit a flawed father, how could he leave without creating a scar that would never heal? Yes, Osho, ego, the false centre. He had been aiming at the wrong galaxy. At least this time he knew his own centre. At least this time he could do the right thing. This would be about his own self, not his ego. He realised he must take control. Whoa, ho, oh, when did that happen? That voice again. Brothers, I will return to retrace our forebears journey of truth and peace. He observed his ego, just like Osho had said it would fall away. There it lay on the ground as a snake sheds its skin. There it was, the husk of the snake he had been moments before. Just look at you, a shell of a man. That's what his younger sister had seen all along. That's what his father had created and that's all that they had been interested in. What will the neighbours think? Your cousin's gone to uni. Keeping up with the Joneses, breaking the chain, 
he saw now. Fucking hell, he said out loud. No wonder it was never advisable to return to the cave. Plato knew something of how powerful his big fat golden lie was. Noble, whatever the fuck it was. Noble lie, yeah, that was it. Remember, Rod, she thought. Pillars of salt and all that. Don't look back. Doubt, always doubt. Too late already. Back to space. Spacewalk drive. Set your controls for the centre of the sun. We're going in. What's that? Lower horizon. Ah, the red planet, Mars. 3 a.m. in the east, lower horizon. Mars, red tint flickering. And another distant memory. Carmel, California. On tour with Godfrey. It was that trip where Roger had taken his first look through a real telescope. Up in Big Sur, the post house ranch. Different times and a different person. Lessons learnt then. The world actually turns on its axis. Other lessons, some people put wealth before friendship. There but for the grace of privilege go I, thought Rog. Not any more, I fucking will not. They can take their control file and shove it up Bunto's arse. You might quite enjoy that. <laughs>